Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 165, Alvin Lamson's On the Doctrine of Two Natures in Jesus Christ, Part 1. Have you ever known anyone who would only listen to one side of any political argument? Maybe they only watch Fox News, or they only watch MSNBC. Maybe they only visit conservative websites, or they only visit progressive websites. A person like this is going to have little to no idea what people on the other side actually think. All they will have ever heard is what people on their side say the other side thinks. If they're serious about persuading anybody on the other side, or even just serious on getting down to the truth of the matter about which political philosophy is most correct, they will have to carefully listen through some of the best proponents of the other side and understand what they're really saying and why they say it. What's true for politics is true for theology. The doctrine that Jesus Christ is one person with two natures, a complete human nature and also a divine nature, is widely assumed in Christianity, and somewhat surprisingly widely assumed by Protestants. This doctrine was famously formulated at a council of Catholic bishops presided over by an emperor in the year 451. Of course, the speculations on this subject, as you'll hear momentarily, began in the second century. In this and in next week's podcast, I'm going to present an interesting little booklet written by a scholar named Alvin Lamson. Lamson was born in 1792 and died in 1864. A lifelong resident of Massachusetts, he was educated at Phillips Academy in Andover, and then he went to Harvard College, graduated in 1814. He served for a year or two as a tutor at Bowdoin College, then he taught for a couple of years in the Divinity School at Harvard. But in 1818, he became pastor of the first church in Dedham, Massachusetts, and he served as their pastor for more than 40 years. He did a lot of work for a publication called the Christian Examiner, but if you really want to get an idea of what kind of thinker he was and how learned he was, you should look at a book called The Church of the First Three Centuries, or Notices of the Lives and Opinions of the Early Fathers, with special reference to the doctrine of the Trinity, illustrating its late origin and gradual formation. On the blog post for this episode, I have a link to where you can get this in print, or you can get the PDF for free online. Another 19th century periodical said this about him, quote, Dr. Lamson has succeeded in uniting the acutest moral wisdom with the most unpretending and childlike modes of exhibiting it. His style is clear as crystal, sometimes almost quaint in its simplicity, and not without touches of poetic feeling as well as fancy, though a calm, shrewd judgment characterizes all his opinions. End quote. I found that to be true. In this episode and the next, I'm going to present an interesting little tract or short book of his, which was published in 1828. It's entitled, On the Doctrine of Two Natures in Jesus Christ. In it, Dr. Lamson gives a number of objections to this doctrine. He first states it as carefully as he can, and in this episode, you'll hear his first three objections. I don't agree with everything he says here, and I think some of his arguments need some work. I think he needs to pay more careful attention to the distinction between qualities which are typical of a certain kind of thing and qualities which are essential to a certain sort of thing, that is, which that type of thing cannot exist without having. You'll also note that he doesn't say anything about kenosis theories of incarnation. The reason for this is they're not part of the historical tradition. They only really were first formulated a little bit later in the 19th century. Finally, I disagree with what he says about human mortality and immortality. If you want to know what I think it means to say that a being is immortal, then check out podcast 145, my presentation called Tis Mystery All, The Immortal Dies. This episode is also interestingly compared with podcasts 143 and 144, my interviews with Dr. Timothy Paul about his important book In Defense of Conciliar Christology. Some of the things that Dr. Lamson says, I think, connect with Paul's view. On the other hand, Paul's book is more carefully argued. 
Having said all of that, I do think that the third objection is really potent right out of the box, and that his first two objections, maybe with a little bit of work, can be made to stick. See what you think. Hear, then, the arguments of a very learned, non-Trinitarian Protestant minister. The doctrine of the Trinity is embarrassed with numerous difficulties, and these difficulties multiply and strengthen in proportion as its several parts and appendages are brought distinctly into view. The hypothesis of two natures in Jesus Christ we deem one of its heaviest encumbrances. The Trinity supposes the truth of this hypothesis. It may be said, in fact, to rest upon it as its basis, and with it must stand or fall. This circumstance has not, we fear, received the attention it deserves. It is true that the advocates for the strict and proper unity of the divine being have occasionally argued from the absurdity of ascribing to an individual a finite and an infinite nature, but the argument has not been urged with due frequency and earnestness. For ourselves, we place great reliance upon it. It has a force, we think, which is not easily resisted. And could we bring no other, we should consider this alone sufficient to put the question of the truth or falsity of opposite views at rest forever. Let us carefully weigh the doctrine of a double nature in Jesus Christ. Let us see to what it amounts, and take a view of some of the chief objections to it. But first, let us glance at its origin and history in the early ages of the Church. We gather from ancient records that the great bulk of plain, unlettered believers, who derived their knowledge of Christianity from its first preachers and their immediate successors, viewed Jesus as a finite and dependent being. That this is true of the whole body of Jewish Christians during their existence as a church admits of no doubt. The uneducated Gentile converts, whose minds were not fettered by the prejudices of learning, partook of the same views. The doctrine of Christ's proper divinity appears to have encountered from them the sternest opposition. They dreaded it on account of its supposed impiety, thinking that it infringed on the supremacy of the Father, and it was not till it had sustained severe and protracted struggles that it finally obtained currency. The learned converts from paganism are entitled to the credit of introducing it. These converts, several of them at least, came fresh from the schools of Alexandria in Egypt, where they had become deeply imbued with the doctrines of the later Platonists, and on embracing Christianity took along with them the sentiments there imbibed. The consequence was that as early as the former part of the second century, the religion of Jesus began to be corrupted, and its simple truths became disfigured by an unnatural union with a speculative and earthborn philosophy. Justin Martyr, A.D. 140, led the way by transferring the Platonic doctrine of the divine reason, Logos, to Christianity. This reason, originally considered an attribute of the Father, he converted into a proper person, making it to constitute the divine nature of Jesus. The first step having been taken, further innovations followed, and the work of corruption soon went on apace. It was aided in its progress by Clemens of Alexandria, A.D. 192, and especially by Origen, A.D. 230, a man of subtle and fervid genius, but of an extravagant imagination and weak judgment, and a very prolific writer. The fame of Origen attracted numerous followers, who afterwards dispersing into various parts, everywhere, to use an expression of the learned Bruckner, quote, sowed the field of God with tares, end quote. The doctrine of the Trinity, however, as explained by the fathers of the first three centuries, we feel authorized to say, was very different from the modern Orthodox doctrine. The perfect equality of the Son with the Father they never dreamed of asserting. Justin Martyr, as the complexion of his whole language testifies, evidently held the belief of his strict and proper inferiority, and such seems to have been the faith of all the Christian writers of any celebrity before the Council of Nicaea, A.D. 325. It is unnecessary to adduce passages in corroboration of this statement, as its truth has been admitted by several learned Trinitarians best acquainted with the writings of Christian antiquity. Among those who have conceded it fully or in substance, it is sufficient to mention the learned Jesuit Patavius and Ralph Cudworth, the profound author of The Intellectual System of the Universe, both orthodox authorities. The fathers of the Council of Nicaea asserted the divinity of the Son, but not his individual identity with the Father. He was 
consubstantial, as they expressed it, with the Father, that is, as they understood it, was in all respects similar, partook of the same specific nature, though not of the same numerical essence, as one man is of the same substance or species with another, although possessing distinct individuality. The councils of Ephesus, A.D. 431, and Chalcedon, A.D. 451, occasioned by the controversies of the Nestorians and Eutychians, the former of whom were accused of dividing the person and the latter of confounding the natures of Jesus Christ, appear to have succeeded but little better than that of Nicaea in defining his divinity, though they undertook to determine the nature and results of its union with humanity. The Council of Chalcedon particularly claims the merit of having ascertained and settled the doctrine of the Incarnation, which, according to its creed, is in substance as follows. Jesus Christ is truly God and man, perfect in both natures, consubstantial with the Father with respect to his divinity, and consubstantial with us with respect to his humanity. The two natures, the divine and human, are indissolubly united in him without confusion or change, each retaining all its former attributes, yet so united as to form one person. The doctrine of the union of the divine and human natures in the person of Jesus Christ, as held by the Orthodox of succeeding ages and received by Trinitarians of the present day, does not differ in any important particulars from that established by the Council of Chalcedon, except perhaps that the term consubstantial, which the fathers of that council, to preserve consistency, must have explained to mean only a specific, would be understood by the moderns to express an individual or numerical identity. Dr. Barrow, one of the most distinguished of the old English divines, thus expresses himself on the subject, quote, We may, with the Holy Fathers and particularly with the great council of Chalcedon, assert that in the incarnation of our Lord, the two natures, the divine and human, were united without any confusion or commixtion, for such a way of blending would induce a third nature different from both. Such a commixtion being supposed, our Lord would be neither God nor man, but another third kind of substance. That would destroy, diminish, or alter the properties of each, which is unsound to say, and impossible to be. Wherefore, both natures in this mystery do subsist entire, distinct, and unconfused, each retaining its essential and natural properties. End quote. After some further remarks of a similar character, he adds, quote, The natures were joined undividedly. There is but one Christ, one person, to whom, being God and being man, are truly and properly attributed. The same person never ceased to be both God and man, not even then when our Lord as man did undergo death, for he raised himself from the dead. He reared the temple of his own body, being fallen. As being God, he was able to raise himself, as being man, he was capable of being raised by himself, the union between God and man persisting when the union between human body and soul was dissolved. End quote. The Church of England, following in the steps of the unreformed Catholic Church, determines that quote, the Son took man's nature so that two whole and perfect natures, that is to say, the Godhead and manhood, were joined together in one person, never to be divided whereof is one Christ, very God, and very man, end quote. It is added by the expositor, quote, The essential properties of one nature were not communicated to the other nature. Each kept his respective properties distinct, without the least confusion in their most intimate union, end quote. Quote, In whatever way, says Professor Stewart, the union of the two natures was effected, it neither destroyed nor essentially changed either the divine or the human nature. End quote. He supposes Christ to be quote, God omniscient and omnipotent, and still a feeble man of imperfect knowledge. End quote. It is unnecessary to add more to show what the received opinion on this subject is. The doctrine of the union of the two natures in the person of Jesus Christ, in the form in which it is stated in the above extracts, is admitted, as far as we know, by all genuine Trinitarians. No one of them doubts that Christ was perfect man. No one of them professes to doubt that he was also perfect God. 
According to this doctrine, when fairly stated, an infinite nature with all its essential attributes of omniscience, omnipotence, necessary and everlasting existence, incapable of suffering or change, was indissolubly united in the person of Jesus Christ with a finite nature with all its properties, as imperfect knowledge, weakness, exposure to sorrow, pain, and death, in such a manner that the two natures remain forever distinct, each retaining unaltered all its former attributes. Now to this extraordinary doctrine we have several strong objections. Before proceeding to state them, however, we will pause to make one observation suggested by the foregoing narrative. It is this. There is a strong antecedent probability that the doctrine will be found, upon examination, to be equally unsupported by Scripture and by reason. It appears from ecclesiastical history that the simple and unlearned Christians of the earlier and purer ages of the Church knew nothing about it that the first traces of it are found among the learned Platonizing converts, that its features were at first rude and imperfect, that it from time to time received modifications and additions as the disciples of the Egyptian philosophy, the most absurd that ever disgraced the human intellect, flowed into the church that it was long opposed on account of its anti-Christian tendency, that so late as the end of the third century it had not succeeded in eradicating from the minds of the generality of Christians, learned or unlearned, the great doctrine of the inferior and derived nature of the Son, and finally that it gathered strength and was matured amid storms of controversy at a time when the principles of sound criticism and just reasoning had fallen into contempt that such a doctrine, growing up with the worst philosophy of the worst times, should originally have sprung from the bosom of Christianity and not from the vicious systems of human speculation in the midst of which it was nurtured, that it should have remained hidden for years in the records of our Savior's instructions and the writings of his apostles, and its existence there not have been suspected till the Alexandrian Platonists pointed it out, is a supposition altogether too extravagant for credit." Its late rise, in union with the philosophical jargon of the age to which it was wedded, and from which it was content to borrow its terms and illustrations, renders it difficult, if not impossible, for us to believe that it was one of the truths which either our Savior or his apostles were commissioned to impart to the world. In tracing its history, indeed, we gather at every step evidence of its human and earthly origin. Our principal objections to the orthodox distinction of two natures in Jesus Christ are that it involves an absurdity, that it destroys the personal unity of Jesus and introduces strange perplexity into our conceptions of his character, that it exposes him to the charge of equivocation and dishonesty, that it destroys the efficacy of his example and nullifies his instructions, that it is unnecessary and fails of the object for which it is alleged to be wanted, that it thus carries with it irresistible evidence of its falsehood. It bears all the marks of a most improbable and extravagant fiction. And finally, that after the most careful search, we find no traces of it in the sacred writings. In the first place, we think that the doctrine of two natures in Jesus Christ, as held by its advocates, is absurd, and consequently that no evidence whatever would be sufficient to establish it. Before we believe it, we must abandon the use of our understandings. We must free ourselves from a disposition to weigh evidence. We must have the convenient pliancy of mind, the happy facility of belief to which the good father had attained when he said, I believe because it is impossible. If we reflect for a moment on the qualities of the divine and human nature, we must, one would think, be convinced that they can never be united in the same mind or person. They are absolutely incompatible with each other. They cannot possibly exist together in the same intelligent agent. What are the attributes of the divine and human natures? 
God is infinite, everlasting, immutable, omnipotent, omniscient, and infallible. Man is finite, limited in knowledge and power, weak, erring, subject to vicissitude, disease, and death. Now let anyone who ventures to use his understanding say whether these qualities are compatible with each other. For ourselves, we think they are such that their union in the same being is naturally impossible. It is the union of infinite and finite, of knowledge and ignorance, of power and weakness, of perfection and imperfection. We may as well talk about the union of light and darkness, or of any two qualities of which the one necessarily implies the negation or absence of the other. What is the consequence of the union of divine and human attributes in the same mind or being, on the supposition admitted by Trinitarians that the two natures remain distinct, none of the qualities of either being lost or changed? Why, that a being may be at the same time infinite and finite, that he may be omnipotent, yet partake of weakness and infirmity, and be unable of himself to do all things? that he may be omniscient, yet ignorant of many things, that he may be the author of the universe, yet a wailing infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, a being incapable of pain and suffering, yet a man of sorrows, who expired on the cross, was placed in a shroud, and slept in the tomb. Now if this be not contradiction and absurdity, we confess we know not what contradiction and absurdity are. We do not think our opponents very fortunate in their attempts to illustrate the doctrine of the two natures in Jesus Christ by comparison. Thus we are told that for an explanation of it we must look into ourselves and consider the union of soul and body in man, quote, for as the reasonable soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, end quote. Such is the language of the Athanasian Creed. The comparison, it suggests, has been a favorite one with the asserters of the theological doctrine of the Incarnation from the time this doctrine came into vogue to the present day. That such has been the fact, we think a remarkable instance of the effect of hereditary prejudices in blinding the understanding and of lamentable weakness of human nature which induces men to listen to flimsy argument and mere sophistry when employed in the support of received opinions. The comparison of the two natures of Jesus Christ with the union of spirit and body in ourselves may serve to introduce confusion and darkness into a person's ideas, in consequence of which he may lose sight of the absurdity of the hypothesis which it is meant to illustrate. Perhaps he may think that he has at length hit upon a parallel which solves all difficulties, but a little sober reflection, we think, must abate his confidence. To us the two cases appear totally dissimilar. Man is a complex being, very different from that compound being which Christ is represented by our adversaries to be. If you admit the common distinction and say that man is made up of matter and spirit, and then inquire what is his nature, the only general and intelligible answer to this inquiry is that it is those properties, corporeal and mental, which result from his constitution and physical organization. That is, all those qualities which constitute him what in his present state he is. Now it cannot be said that any of these qualities are incompatible with others. There is nothing in any of them which makes it a contradiction or absurdity to suppose that they may all exist together in the same subject. You may indeed affirm of a part what is not true of the whole of man. You may say of his body that it has extension and solidity, and attribute to his mind perception, memory, judgment. But here is no contradiction. You do not attribute to him as an undivided whole opposite qualities. You do not ascribe to his person qualities or acts so utterly repugnant that one necessarily excludes the other, as light excludes darkness or omnipotence weakness. Our objection to the union of two natures in the person of Jesus Christ is that it brings together an assemblage of qualities which are incompatible with each other, that it ascribes to Christ as an individual or person properties between which there is such an utter repugnance, such direct opposition, that they cannot exist together in the same subject. Trinitarians affirm that Christ is perfect God and perfect man, Consequently, he must have all the qualities of both, as omnipotence and weakness, infallibility and fallibility, infinite knowledge and limited and partial information, and these qualities are affirmed of him in a personal character. Man presents no phenomenon resembling this, no such combination of incongruous and opposite qualities. To say of Christ that he is divine and human, 
infinite and finite, omnipotent and weak, is to assert nothing more strange or mysterious, it is contended, than to affirm of man that he is mortal and immortal. But the fallacy of this statement is quite obvious. The expressions in question do not belong to the same class, nor have they any real but only a seeming resemblance. When we say that man is mortal and immortal, we do not employ terms which, in the connection in which they stand, have any opposition or repugnance. They are not, in fact, opposites. They convey no incompatible ideas. What we affirm in one part of the proposition we do not deny in the other. By the assertion, man is mortal, we mean that his present mode of existence will cease, and that by the assertion that he is immortal, we mean that he will continue in being forever. The two assertions are distinct, but not opposed. We affirm simply that man will undergo a change at death, but that this change will not amount to an absolute annihilation of his being, and in this proposition there is nothing contradictory or absurd. A similar explanation may be given of numerous other propositions in which the same thing is apparently affirmed and denied of the same subject. The terms in different parts of the proposition either change their significance or they are used in senses not really but only apparently opposed. The same solution, however, does not apply to the proposition Christ is finite and infinite, for the terms here employed are by their nature wholly opposed and undergo no change of signification in the different parts of the proposition. We affirm in one breath that he is finite and not finite, God and not God, the terms the whole time being used in the same sense, and thus fall into as palpable a contradiction as could be uttered. We object, in the second place, to the doctrine of the two natures in Jesus Christ as held by Trinitarians, that it destroys his personal unity, that it makes him two distinct persons, two beings. It is not necessary for us here to go into the metaphysical inquiry in what personality consists. Our common apprehensions are sufficient to guide us. A person is an intelligent agent. He has one will and one consciousness. He has perceptions and feelings which he may properly call his own. Now we maintain that personality, thus explained, simple, undivided personality and individuality, belongs to Jesus as truly and properly as it belongs to any other being. We maintain that he is really one, one mind, one person, one being, having one undivided consciousness. In a word, that he is one, in the same sense in which either of us is one. This we hold to be a fundamental and self-evident truth, and we think that any hypothesis or view which is subversive of it, a hypothesis which divides Christ, makes him two persons, two beings, as separate and distinct as any two of us are, bears the stamp of error on its very face. This consequence, we hesitate not to say, is chargeable on the views entertained by Trinitarians concerning the divine and human natures of Christ. They assign to him two entire and distinct minds, the one infinitely superior to the human, having distinct properties, views, and perceptions, having, in fact, nothing in common with human nature, the other, human, having a will, perceptions, and feelings exclusively its own. This surely makes Christ two persons, if we understand anything about personality. This surely makes Christ two persons, if we understand anything about personality, and two as far removed from each other as infinite from finite. He possesses, we are informed, proper and supreme divinity, united with a human soul, perfect and entire in all its capacities and affections. He is God and man. Now God is an intelligent agent. The human mind of Christ is another intelligent agent. Each nature, we are told, retains its proper attributes. The essential properties of one are not imparted to the other. How it is possible to escape the conclusion that here are two intelligent agents, two persons we acknowledge we are unable to conjecture. 
It is really a matter of astonishment to us that anyone who reflects at all on the subject does not perceive the insuperable difficulties which the hypothesis of two natures presents with regard to the personal unity of the Savior. Trinitarians do not hesitate to ascribe to each of the two supposed natures of Jesus Christ qualities strictly personal. They sometimes speak of him as having the essential attributes of God, as performing what God alone can perform. Other times they describe him as having the perceptions and all the sinless infirmities of man, as being tempted and exposed to suffering as we are. It appears surprising that they do not perceive that in doing this they make him two beings, as distinct from each other as any two of their fellow mortals are, and as remote as God is from man. It is true that formally and in words they ascribe to him undivided personality. Thus the Council of Ephesus decided in opposition to Nestorius that the two natures in Jesus Christ form one person. But this, we have seen, is an impossible supposition. The two natures necessarily form two separate and entire agents, each possessing proper individuality and consciousness. And as long as each nature retains its particular properties and affections, they must remain two, two individuals, persons, agents. No human decrees can alter the nature of things. Truth is truth and falsehood is falsehood, whether men perceive it or not. Councils may vote that two is one, that two minds and two agents form one mind and one agent. But what then? Can their votes render that true, which is by the nature of things impossible or absurd? The importance of preserving the strict and proper unity of Jesus Christ and the strange confusion and absurdity which would result from a belief of his divided personality and twofold being, will, and consciousness would authorize us to dwell longer on this topic. But on so plain a point, it seems difficult to speak without becoming trite. To resort to any labored argument or abstract process of reasoning to prove that two minds, a finite and infinite, divine and human, supposed to be lodged in the same fleshly tabernacle, yet retaining each its original, distinct, and proper attitudes, necessarily form two, two persons, two beings, two agents, would seem a foolish waste of time and labor. A simple statement of the point in debate appears, in our view, all that is needed. Let the doctrine of the two natures in its received form be fairly explained. We think we may safely appeal to any person of a plain and unprejudiced mind and ask whether such a doctrine can possibly be true. No argument seems necessary to its refutation. It carries evidence of its falsehood on its very front. The fact that it violates the personal unity of the Savior, assigning to him a double individuality, if we may so express ourselves, making him, in reality, two beings, in the same sense in which God and any one of his intelligent and finite offspring are two, at once and fully condemns it. Our next objection is of a graver character. The doctrine we are examining implicates, as we conceive, the moral character of our Savior, impeaches his veracity, and attributes to him deceit, equivocation, and falsehood. This is a very weighty charge. We cannot endure to hear the name of Jesus, even by supposition, coupled with fraud and dishonesty. We regard him as holy, harmless, and undefiled, in a sense in which no other being who has ever trodden our earth has a claim to be called such. The purity of his mind could not be surpassed. It was entire and perfect, partaking of the brightness of divinity, an inflexible love of truth, an openness, and beautiful and majestic simplicity were among the most striking features of his character. For these features, for his purity, his ingenuousness, and his truth, we reverence him and would combat with our whole strength whatever views tend to impair or destroy this reverence. We hold a belief in his integrity among our firmest, fondest persuasions, and this belief nothing would tempt us to resign. 
to be compelled to abandon it, to have our confidence in the pure character of Jesus of Nazareth shaken, and to be forced to conclude that in imparting his doctrines to the world, and even in his hours of familiar interaction with his disciples, he made use of deceit or mental reservation, would cause us insupportable gloom and anguish. We object to the doctrine of the two natures, that it wrests from us this precious persuasion, a persuasion of his entire sincerity and explicitness. Let it not be said that the doctrine is not chargeable with any such consequence. It is, according to every view we can take of it, justly chargeable with it. Thus we are told that Jesus sometimes spoke and acted in his human and sometimes in his divine nature that when he said he could of himself do nothing, he meant that as man he could do nothing, although as God he could do all things. When he declared that he knew not the day and hour of judgment, we are to understand by this declaration that he was ignorant of it as man, although he knew it perfectly well as God. Now this, we affirm, is precisely what, in a fellow mortal, we should call by the mildest term equivocation. It is absolutely inconsistent with that openness and integrity which we are authorized by the laws of social interaction to expect from one another. When one affirms that he does not know a thing, he means, if he is an honest man, that he does not know it in any way whatever. It is vain for him to allege that he knows it only in a certain character, that he is ignorant of it as man, as if a priest should declare that he is ignorant of a fact as man, though he knows it as confessor. Or a person should affirm that, as a corporeal being, he is ignorant of what, as an intelligent or spiritual being, he knows well enough. This will not save him from the charge of equivocation or falsehood. Let us beware of ascribing to Christ conduct which would be thought disingenuous or immoral in a fellow mortal. If he did not deceive, if he made the ordinary use of language, he could not declare that he was ignorant of what he knew in any manner whatever. It is a poor subterfuge to say that he was ignorant of it in his human, though he knew it in his divine nature. No matter in what way he knew it, if he knew it in either nature, he knew it in a personal capacity, his person including both natures. That is, he knew it in an absolute sense and could not then, with reason or truth, declare his ignorance of it. Would his disciples, or those who heard him, suspect him of any reservation or of using equivocal language? Would they not suppose that when he told them he did not know or could not do a thing, his words were to be understood in their ordinary sense? If they were used in any uncommon sense, which he took no care to point out, How can he be defended from the charge of having made a deceitful use of language? If words have any meaning, our Savior expressly disclaims the possession of any attributes strictly and properly divine, as omnipotence, quote, I can of my own self do nothing, end quote. Supreme, infinite goodness, quote, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one, that is God, end quote. Omniscience, quote, No man knows that day and that hour, not even the Son, but only the Father. This is plain language. There is no mystery or obscurity in it. The terms I, me, self, as everyone knows, always denote an individual or person, and they include the whole of that person. They are not appropriated to any part or member of such person. They comprehend all which goes to constitute him what he is viewed as an individual or whole. In this sense, our Savior must have used them, or he must have been guilty of manifest prevarication. To say that by self he meant only the inferior part of his nature, and intended to assert only that this part was not truly divine, or did not possess inherently and of itself infinite power and knowledge, is to make him express himself as no honest man, not bereft of sober senses, ever did or would. This week's thinking music has been Stars Collide, instrumental version by Josh Woodward. Check out the rest of his music at joshwoodward.com. Next week, the rest of Dr. Lamson's short book and the rest of his objections to classical two-nature Christologies.
If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share the podcast on social media. Another thing you can do is give us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can support the podcast by giving us a one-time or a monthly donation through PayPal. Just look for the orange buttons on the right side of any blog post. Lastly, make your voice heard. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode. Or join our very active Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. Don't forget then to share, to rate, to chip in when you can, and to talk back. For listening, we'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind. <laughs>